Hi, everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about the evidence on labor induction for gestational diabetes. Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to welcome you back to another evidence-based birth podcast episode. In today's podcast, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to do a solo episode where I'm going to talk with you all about the research evidence on labor induction for gestational diabetes mellitus, which can be abbreviated GDM. Now, a few months ago, we released an article all about the evidence on diagnosing GDM, and you can find that article at ebbirth.com slash diagnosing GDM. That's all one word, diagnosing GDM. But we wanted to follow up that article with another signature article focused solely on the evidence on labor induction versus expectant management for GDM. So two of the main questions that come up when people have GDM are the following. Should labor be induced because I have GDM? And if induction is chosen, when should it occur? With GDM, the main alternative to labor induction is expectant management. The definition of expectant management means you're declining an elective induction, and instead you plan to wait for labor to start on its own. However, with expectant management, that doesn't always mean that you will labor spontaneously. It could mean that you might be induced later if complications develop or if you go too far past your due date, or you could be induced electively if you change your mind. So expectant management is kind of an umbrella term for all of those different situations that could occur if you decline an elective induction today. Now, if you aren't familiar with the pathophysiology of gestational diabetes, I encourage you to look at our signature article on diagnosing gestational diabetes, or you can just visit the podcast episode 59, where we cover the physiology and pathophysiology of gestational diabetes in detail. Now, in terms of labor induction solely for gestational diabetes, this is a question that I've been getting since the very beginning of evidence-based birth in 2012. A lot of people came to me and told me that they were being pressured into an induction for gestational diabetes. Now, there's very little data on how often people with GDM are induced because of their diagnosis. Birth certificates in the United States do not accurately track labor induction or the reasons for labor induction. There was one study published by Dublin in 2014 that looked at more than 330,000 births in the U.S. Now, this was a while ago. The study took place from 2001 to 2007. Overall, about 30% of the people in the study were induced. And the researchers found that diabetes, either gestational diabetes or pre-existing type 2 diabetes, was the medical reason given for 10% of the medically indicated inductions. That is really the only number from the U.S. that we were able to find. Now, because some people with GDM and their babies are at increased risk of pregnancy complications, Often that's why you hear care providers encouraging women with GDM to plan an early birth, usually with elective induction at or around the time of term or a little bit before term, instead of waiting for labor to start on its own. So what does the evidence show on this topic? Well, in 2018, Beat C et al. published a Cochrane review in which they searched for randomized controlled trials that compared a planned early birth, either elective induction or elective cesarean, at or near term, 37 to 40 weeks gestation, versus expectant management for people with GDM. Unfortunately, they found only one randomized control trial to include in the review. This was a large study published by Alberico in 2017, and it took place at eight hospitals in Italy, Slovenia, and Israel. The people in the study all had diagnosed GDM, and they had no maternal or fetal medical complications at that time point, other than the GDM diagnosis. In this trial, they randomly assigned 214 women either to an induction of labor between 38 weeks zero days and 39 weeks zero days, or to expectant management, waiting for labor to start. You would wait up until 41 weeks and zero days, as long as no medical problems developed. And if you did develop medical problems, you could be induced. The expectant management group also received fetal monitoring tests twice weekly until the time of birth. So again, the two groups were basically induction during that 38th week of pregnancy or waiting up until 41 weeks and zero days for an induction. 
The researchers found that for babies, there was no differences between groups and the number of large babies or babies weighing more than 8 pounds, 13 ounces, or 4,000 grams. There was also no differences between groups and the risk of shoulder dystocia, newborn breathing problems, low blood sugar for newborns, or newborns needing intensive care. More babies in the early term induction group experienced jaundice, 10% versus 4%. For mothers, there was no difference between groups and the risk of cesarean, births with forceps or vacuum, postpartum hemorrhage, intensive care, or intact perineum. And there were no deaths among mothers or babies in this study. Now, the Cochrane reviewers said that the quality of evidence from this one randomized trial was considered low to very low because there is a high risk of bias because there was no blinding. Also, the study was really too small to look at differences in rare outcomes such as death. One thing I forgot to mention earlier was that early term induction was linked to an overall lower average birth weight for the newborns. However, the decrease in the baby's birth weight with early term induction did not make a difference for any of the clinically important outcomes, including the number of large babies weighing 4,000 grams or more, uh, the rate of cesareans, or the rate of shoulder dystocia. In this study, shoulder dystocia, or difficulty birthing the shoulders of the baby, occurred in three births in the early induction group and one birth in the expectant management group, and this number of shoulder dystocias in the both groups was not significant, and all four cases were resolved without any problems. Now, because there's only one randomized controlled trial on the topic of inducing labor versus expectant management for GDM, it's really important for us to take a step back and look at observational studies. So in an observational study, we're not going to randomly assign anyone to an experiment. Instead, researchers are usually looking back in time using medical records to see what happened when someone chose induction versus expectant management. So my research editor and I, Anna Bertoni, we did a literature review, a search, looking for studies that have been published in the past nine years. Since anything that was done earlier than that, unfortunately, usually included type 1 and type 2 diabetes along with the gestational diabetes. So we were specifically interested in induction for gestational diabetes. We found four studies that looked specifically at birth outcomes, comparing people who had early induction versus those who chose expectant management with GDM. Now, the largest study that we found on this topic was published by Melamed in 2016. They included more than 8,000 pregnant people with GDM, They found that inducing labor at 39 weeks for GDM is linked to a lower rate of cesareans, fewer cases of preeclampsia or gestational hypertension, and more use of epidurals compared to expectant management at those time frames. However, when they looked exclusively at first-time mothers with GDM, there was no benefit to inducing labor at 38 weeks. Only the 39-week induction was linked to a lower rate of cesareans, compared to following expectant management to 40 weeks or longer. The cesarean rate was 19.6% in the 39-week induction group and 22.9% cesarean rate in the expectant management group. In another study carried out by Figali et al. in 2016, researchers also looked at cervical ripeness and whether or not the mothers had given birth before. And they found that people with GDM who've had a previous vaginal birth significantly increase the risk of cesarean by attempting an induction before 39 weeks, especially with an unripe cervix. Therefore, based on this study and the Melamed study, it appears that a 38-week elective induction for GDM should not be routinely recommended to mothers. Now, in the Figali 2016 study, induction at 39 weeks resulted in a similar cesarean rate compared to expectant management at that time. After 40 weeks gestation, everybody had an increase in cesareans, regardless of whether their labors were induced or spontaneous. Another study carried out by Sutton in 2014 also found no difference in the cesarean rate with elective induction at 39 weeks compared to expectant manage at that time. They also, though, did find that the rate of cesareans significantly goes up with gestational age, which is a very common finding. We see that in a lot of different populations, not just people with GDM. However, contrary to the previous study by Figali, the study by Sutton only found an increase in the risk of cesarean with gestational age among people who had their labors induced, not those who went into labor spontaneously. So how can we summarize these findings from these different studies? Kind of wrap it all up. 
The largest study on this topic found a lower cesarean rate with 39-week induction, and the other two studies that were smaller found no difference between 39-week induction and expectant management at that time. However, researchers have pretty consistently observed that the cesarean rate among people with GDM attends to increase with gestational age after 40 weeks with both induction and spontaneous labor. So you might be wondering why is it that the cesarean rate goes up after 40 weeks, whether or not you have your labor induced with gestational diabetes. And the thought is perhaps, you know, if the pregnancy continues for past 40 weeks and you have GDM, this leaves more time for potential medical problems to develop. In other words, you're more likely to become, quote, high risk. It could also be that care providers are quicker to recommend a cesarean at later gestational ages because they might be a little bit more nervous inducing someone with GDM who's at 41 or 42 weeks and might be more quicker to revert to a cesarean during that induction. Now, I mentioned the Melamed study earlier. That's the largest observational study on GDM and induction. They also looked at newborn outcomes with elective induction versus expectant management. And they found that newborns of mothers with GDM who are induced during the 38th week tend to have more health problems than newborns of mothers who are induced during their 39th week. Compared to expectant management, a 38-week induction with GDM is linked to fewer babies with a large birth weight, but higher rates of intensive care unit admission, jaundice, and low blood sugar. On the other hand, when they looked at 39-week induction, they did not see those complications with labor induction. A 39-week induction compared to expectant management, the induction was linked to fewer cases of large babies and fewer cases of newborn breathing problems without any increase in intensive care unit admission, jaundice, or low blood sugar. When they looked at 41-week induction, however, the risk of intensive care unit admission did go up among people who had their labors induced at 41 weeks. Finally, a lot of people say that one of the reasons their care providers recommend a labor induction for GDM is because of the risk of stillbirth and infant death. Now, when care providers suggest that inducing labor early for GDM reduces your risk of your baby either experiencing a stillbirth or infant death, and when this is combined, it's called perinatal death. When care providers are talking about this, they're probably referencing findings from a large study carried out by Rosenstein and published in 2012. This was a retrospective study that looked back in time at birth outcomes among people with GDM. This study found that expectant management at 39 and 40 weeks carried an 80% higher relative risk of perinatal death compared to going ahead and giving birth at that time. Now, relative risk is a useful way of comparing risk from one group to another. However, we're talking about rare events. So the relative risk tends to cause people to, in their minds, overestimate the effect. In this case, overestimating risks of continuing the pregnancy. When we look at absolute risk or the actual chance of the event occurring, the absolute risk of perinatal death is very low whether you choose to be induced or follow expectant management with GDM. At 39 weeks, the absolute risk of stillbirth or newborn death was 9 deaths per 10,000 for people who gave birth at 39 weeks versus 15 deaths per 10,000 with people who had expectant management for one more week. At 40 weeks, the absolute risk for those who gave birth was 10 deaths per 10,000 versus 17 deaths per 10,000 for those who followed expectant management for one more week. One statistic that researchers like to look at is something called the number needed to treat. That's how many people you would need to treat in order to prevent one bad outcome. The number needed to treat or the number of women who would need to be treated with induction to prevent one death at 39 weeks was very high. It would take about 1,500 labor inductions to prevent one perinatal death at 39 weeks and about 1,300 inductions at 40 weeks to prevent one perinatal death with GDM. I also think it's important to talk about the effectiveness of treatments for GDM because there are treatments that you can have for GDM during pregnancy that lower your risk of experiencing complications or having poor outcomes. If you have GDM, treatment with diet changes, exercise, and sometimes medicine may be necessary to maintain healthy blood sugar levels. And with effective treatment, it means that you could lower your risk of having complications such as a big baby or shoulder dystocia. When you're reducing your risk of complications by being treated for GDM, then it's possible there may be less potential benefit from labor induction because you're bringing your risk back down to 
be more in line with a normal pregnancy because you've been treating the GDM and keeping your blood sugars normal. So in the signature article, I'm not going to go into this detail now on the podcast, but you can go to the signature article at evbirth.com slash inducing GDM. That's slash inducing GDM, all one word. And you can see more info there about the latest research on treatment for gestational diabetes and how effective they are. But overall, the good news is that treatment for gestational diabetes improves outcomes in the research. I also wanted to let you know about recently updated practice guidelines on labor induction with gestational diabetes. If you look at ACOG's guidelines or the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, their 2018 guidelines on gestational diabetes advise against inducing labor before 39 weeks in people with GDM who have well-controlled blood sugar levels with diet and exercise alone. For people who have well-controlled blood sugar levels with GDM, through using diet and exercise, they recommend that expectant management is appropriate up to 40 weeks and six days. For people with GDM who have well-controlled blood sugar with medication, ACOG recommends birth between 39 weeks and zero days to 39 weeks and six days. ACOG guidance suggests that even earlier inductions for people with poorly controlled blood sugar levels are appropriate, but it's important to consider the trade-offs since prematurity also carries risks. We found a couple other professional guidelines in the United Kingdom. Guidelines advise people with GDM to give birth no later than 40 weeks and six days. And in Canada, the current recommendation from the year 2016 is that pregnant people with GDM should be offered an induction between 38 weeks to 40 weeks, depending on their blood sugar control and other risk factors. So to wrap it all up, what did we really find when we looked at the research and when we worked on the signature article? Well, we found that at this time, there's there's no evidence from randomized control trials to support routinely inducing labor at 38 or 39 weeks for everyone with GDM. The only randomized trial we have on this topic did not find any benefits for mothers or babies from elective induction in the 38th week of pregnancy versus waiting for labor to start on its own until 41 weeks, as long as there were no medical problems. However, importantly, this trial was not large enough to look at rare outcomes such as stillbirth. On the other hand, we have some evidence from observational studies from people with GDM who gave birth at 39 or 40 weeks, showing that there's a lower relative risk of perinatal death compared to those who continue the pregnancy past 40 weeks. However, the absolute risk of perinatal death was low, whether you choose a planned early birth or wait for labor to start on its own. Finally, the largest observational study to look at maternal and newborn outcomes from elective induction for GDM found that induction of labor at 39 weeks is linked to a lower rate of cesarean and lower rates of preeclampsia and hypertension compared to waiting until at least 40 weeks to give birth. Newborns of mothers who were induced during the 39th week of pregnancy in that study were less likely to be born large, and they were less likely to have newborn breathing problems compared to those born at 40 weeks and later. So that wraps up the evidence that we found about inducing labor for GDM. If you go to ebbirth.com slash inducing GDM, that's all one word, slash inducing GDM, you'll see we have a free one-page handout that you can download to use with providers or with clients. Also, don't forget to check out our article on diagnosing GDM. That is evbirth.com slash diagnosing GDM. And we also have an article all about induction or cesarean for suspected big babies that we look at evidence with and without gestational diabetes in that article. And you can read that article at ebbirth.com slash big baby. We couldn't have published the signature article without our expert reviewers, Shannon Volk, Courtney Barnes, and Melissa Rosenstein. And I want to give a shout out to Kristen Pascucci for always helping us with our medical editing. So I hope you learned something new today about evidence on inducing labor versus expectant management for gestational diabetes. And I hope that this article is helpful for those of you who are talking about this issue with parents. Thanks, everyone. And I'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.